Can you say who you are and what your question is? Sorry, my name's Ray Brady. Um, one of the, I've just discovered this, it's when you're saying about the face recognition. Have you heard of prosagnosia? Uh, prosagnosia? Yeah. Can we just hold that question and I'm going to... Uh, do, sorry, that was yeah, just... Yeah. Um, what I'm asking the other lady is, you know how you were talking about violence reduction, A, um, crime prevention, and B, um, I've thought this for years about mental health. How can they find, uh, uh, give drugs to people if, for mental health problems if the mind's not part of the body? Can we change it to neurological malfunction? I've got 40 million of them, but I don't think I'm mentally ill, but it's the effect I have on other people because, right, okay, thanks very much. <laughs> Um, William Nelson here. Um, both of you talked about um, surveillance and accessing data in certain ways. So in your opinion, do you think that um, accessing just public data is, is enough for the police force to do their jobs? Or do they require the extended powers and um, access to more private data that UK lawmakers appear to be pushing for? And uh, a further question down here. Uh, hi there, my name's Gillian Thompson. Um, I wanted to ask Karen a question. Um, she was talking about um, risk prevention and um, sort of like identifying risk and, and preventing violence. Um, what I wanted to ask was, don't we then, aren't we at risk ourselves of um, labelling groups of people as potentially violent when those you know, things have when those acts haven't been carried out yet. Okay, do you want to have a go at those, those questions? Uh, I'll take, shall I take prosopagnosia first? <laughs> well, it's really interesting that you mentioned that because Jean and I were having a discussion before our session tonight, we were having a coffee and we were talking about prosopagnosia. And yeah, it's, the, it's, an, it's called face blindness. So the inability to recognize people that you know, and sometimes it can be so severe that you don't recognize yourself in the mirror. Um, so we, what we think at the moment is face processing is on a continuum. So we have people with prosopagnosia at the bottom who are very poor. And at the moment, Jean mentioned our work with super recognizers. There are groups of people in the population, we think, who are uh, exceptionally good at rec recognizing faces. Um, so it is very much a continuum, yeah. to answer your question. I would think probably the majority of people that I deal with have some level of mental health problems, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and, and, and a whole range of, of issues. It's probably too big. I mean, we maybe should chat later on, you know, because it's, it'd probably take up far too much time to start to talk about some of the things that we do in the over-prescribing and, and a whole range of other things and people on medication for decades and decades and decades. Um, but it's probably one of the most biggest challenges and trying to refer people on to mental health services is absolutely next to impossible. Um, because they're so overwhelmed and so stretched right the way across the UK and indeed across Canada and the States. So it is, it's a pretty big problem that we're dealing with. The private and public data, right? I used to be, before I did the violence reduction, I used to be head of intelligence analysis. I've got a really strange view on it. I think you give your privacy away at your peril. I think... Um, it's sometimes like boiling a frog, isn't it? Sometimes we change legislation and it's by one degree at a time and then suddenly you realise you've got no privacy left. I think everybody should become involved in some of the discussions. If there's public consultations go out about changes in legislation, about data, I absolutely think that people should put in you know, their opinions, etc. because so often lots of stuff goes through Parliament unchallenged. And I think I value my privacy. I think it's probably one of the greatest things that we have in the UK and in Scotland, that we still have a level of protection of privacy and we give it away at our peril. So, however, there are other sides. I've dealt with some serious and organised criminals and people who are a real danger to people and who deserve to be in jail because 
Whilst I do a lot of prevention, I am no liberal. There are people that I deal with that have been so dangerous, they need to go to jail, and some of them for a very long time. And, and then there are cases that you, you know that you can get some very private data, but it just needs to be really defined. It can't be for everybody. Some of the surveillance data that I've been dealing with in the hospitals has informed us about prevention, but it's not personal. I never get people's names, but I get increasing levels of data about where it happened. Pubs, for example. People will tell me they've been assaulted in a pub. And, you know, it, it never appears on police data systems. You know, and then we can go back and challenge licensing, and it's a preventative measure. Okay, and then just finally and briefly, the, the question about labelling people who are uh, potentially at risk of violence in the future. I think this is about understanding our research. I'm not saying they're going to be at, you know, at risk of violence. What I'm saying is if you're brought up in a chaotic, chaotic household, you're a victim of neglect, you've got domestic abuse, there's parental mental illness, there's a whole range of chaos, you are at risk and at risk of something. Now, the outcome might not be violence. It could be suicide. It could be mental health problems. Because the challenge is that if you know something and then don't do anything about it, then I think that's... That's neglect of service. If you knew I was at risk of breast cancer and then did nothing about it in terms of screening, then that would be neglect as well. So I think it's understanding the research, understanding the evidence, and then acting appropriately to make lives better. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to uh, cut you off there. I can see there are more questions that people would like to ask, but I'm afraid we're out of time. And my suggestion is that you try and collar one of the speakers <laughs> over the drinks that we've got uh, coming up shortly. And I'd just like to ask uh, Susan Stewart, who's the director of the OU in Scotland, to host. Well, I think the fact that we, we are over time uh, shows how interesting the, the contributions from Jean Carn and Hayley were. And thank you to all of you again for joining us tonight. Um, this is just one of many topics that the Open University engages with. We are committed to bringing excellent quality higher education to those who wouldn't otherwise benefit from a university education. And we're also equally committed to engaging with some of the challenges which Scotland and the wider UK society face. Our practice is to share the knowledge to create a fa fairer, healthier, more socially just, and in this case, a safer world. So if you'll forgive me, although we are nearly out of time, I just want to do a wee bit of a sales pitch. If you'd like to find out more about our courses, um, many of which relate to tonight's topic, uh, please visit the Open University website, which is Open University, www.openuniversity.ac.uk. And we've got this in a slide somewhere. Um, we've got over 15,000 students in Scotland. We have students in every single part of Scotland and every single parliamentary constituency. We are unique among Scotland's 19 universities in that statistics. We don't require any entrance qualifications whatsoever uh, for most of our, our undergraduate courses. And if you live in Scotland and your personal income, your personal income, not your household income, is uh, less than £25,000 per year, then the chances are that you'll probably be eligible for a part-time fee grant to cover the cost of fees. Um, we also have lots and lots of free, shorter courses for people who just are interested in a particular subject, but you don't necessarily want to sign up for a degree, or you think that you might want to do a degree, but you're not sure, and you want a little taster. And you can find those courses on the Open University's free learning site, Open Learn. Um, as mentioned, uh, and, and we'd be very, very uh, delighted to, to have you. I think our Open Learn courses, which range from you know six weeks, uh, a few hours a week, to, to 12 weeks, a few more. No exams, uh, no obligation on your part. Just come into our site, uh, see what interests you. Uh, I've done so myself, and at some point in the near future, I may get some time to actually do one of those courses. Uh, please explore what's available. We are interested in your feedback about the event, so if you can fill in the questionnaires that are uh, up at the back of the room. Um, there's a box at the back of the room, and that helps us improve our events in the future. So with, with um, great um, delight at the, the quality of our, our speakers tonight, I'm sure you'd want to join me in thanking all three of them for their contributions here tonight. Thanks very much.